on track of our 21st century. Things have become wireless now. Our cooking is fireless. Our cars are keyless. Our food is fatless. Our tires are tubeless. Our tools cordless. Our dress sleeveless. Our youth jobless. Our leaders shameless. Relationships have become meaningless. Our attitude is careless. Wives are fearless. Babies are fatherless. Feelings are heartless. Education is now valueless. Children are mannerless. Government is useless. And the masses of people are helpless. <coughs> Everything is becoming less. Except for our hope in God which is endless. In fact, I am speechless because our salvation remains priceless. That's deep, but it's so true. I am really torn between two things today. I, I loved our season of prayer with you. And I, I literally have all these pages of notes for the book of James. So let's turn to the book of James, chapter 1. I'm already there. Read with me, please, or follow along as I read down to verse number 8, starting at verse number 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. To the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing verse 5 is the key verse of the entire book and I'll tell you why as we get deeper into our study if any of you lack wisdom let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and abradeth not or doesn't hold back, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavers is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. I think last night is a great example of how we can be driven by wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. And verse number 8 a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Church, literally, I could spend the next three weeks just on the first eight verses. Let's start with the first word. James. Which James? There are several men named James in the Bible. There are several of them. One, of course, is known as James the Just, or the half-brother of Jesus. As a matter of fact, after Jesus' birth, that was virgin-born, his father being God, James was his first younger brother, and his father was Joseph. As a matter of fact, Joseph and Mary had seven children after the birth of Jesus, naturally, as husband and wife. James was the firstborn. Can you imagine, just for a second, living with Jesus as your older brother in the house? 
Who took that last piece of candy? Well, we know it wasn't Jesus. Who didn't do his chores? Well, we know it wasn't Jesus. Look who got straight A's in synagogue. Must be Jesus. How would you like to live with that? That bar is set so high it's unreachable. And we should know that today, shouldn't we? Unreachable. By the way, there's another half-brother of Jesus that we know as Jude. Wow. Can you imagine a family? Talk about a Hall of Fame family. Well, we have Jesus, the Savior of the world. Then we have James, who was one of his disciples. And, oh, yeah, by the way, he was a senior pastor at the Church of Jerusalem. Oh, and also, James, you know James, my son, Jesus' half-brother. He wrote one of the books of the Bible. He wrote one of the general epistles. What are the general epistles? Any epistle that begins with the name of a man is a general epistle. James, Timothy, Peter, Titus, Jude. They're not written to any specific person or place. They're gender for us all. They're for all of us. When you get to Paul, he has titles like 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Romans, right? Are you with me? He wrote to specific places. Philemon, a specific person. But James and Jude were not like that. Their, their information is for all of us. As a matter of fact, the book of James is probably the most practical book. It's, it's a, a, a template for how we should live our life. There was James, the brother of John. Remember the sons of thunder? James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Wasn't that John? Because he was killed before the book was even written. Couldn't have been him. Maybe it was James, the son of Alphaeus, one of Jesus' other disciples. No, that wasn't the case either. He was kind of an unknown person. Didn't have the authentication that James, the half-brother of Jesus, did, being the pillar, the pillar of the church at Jerusalem. And then there's another James we know nothing about except he was the father of Judas, not Iscariot. That's all the Bible says about the last James. So which one was it? Well, historians, theologians, commentators all agree that the writer of this general epistle is the same James who received a special resurrection visit by his half-brother. Can you imagine? 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote chapter 15, verse 7, and Jesus appeared to James. Wow. You got to understand that growing up in that family, they didn't think Jesus was the Messiah. Are you kidding me? They didn't believe it. No, no way. Until the resurrected Christ made his appearance. All of a sudden, by the way, please know this, things happen in our lives on purpose, on time, by the plan of God. You must know that. God has a plan, he's organized, he does everything decently and in order. And when things happen to us, good, bad, or indifferent, it's according to God's plan. And that's exactly what James is telling us. Um, my brethren, count it all joy when you're tempted. All joy when you're tested. All joy when you go through trials. No, the trials in and of themselves are not fun. But rejoice in the fact that you've got the opportunity through that test, through that trial, to be drawn closer to the King of Kings. There is so much meat in just these first two verses, 
James. And, and how does he describe himself? I want everybody for eternity future to know that I'm the half-brother of Jesus. That's right. I was one of the apostles too. Uh -huh. That's right, I'm bad. That's not James. Can you imagine the heart of humility when James begins his letter to us and he says, James, the servant, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you've got to step back to, to 44 AD and understand what was going on at that time. There was persecution, there was uh, death, there was government rule, both the Romans and the Sanhedrin were going after Christians. Just like, by the way, put your seatbelt on, church. It's coming to a city near us sooner rather than later. You must know that and prepare for it. There's one, there are ways you can prepare physically. There are ways you can prepare mentally and spiritually, but you must be ready because it's not if it happens, it's when it happens. And that's why James is writing this. Who's he writing it to? His, his church members there in Jerusalem? Now, folks, I want you to know it's pretty rough out there, but we're all okay here. We're okay here in this synagogue, in this assembly. No. James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. That takes incredible humility and honor and love and adoration for my big brother, for Jesus. And then he says something that is so simple. Paul never used this salutation. He just says, greeting. I'm thinking about you. Paul usually adds uh, an apostle of Jesus Christ or he adds some kind of declaration of authority. James doesn't do that. I'm a bond servant. I'm a servant of Jesus because I want to be. Oh my goodness. So what did that get James? We'll get to that in a second. I don't want to get ahead of myself. James is writing this letter to his people that were scattered after the martyrdom of Stephen. The persecution was so intense, they were going house to house to house. And if they found Christians, they were dead. They would be killed. Stephen was martyred. The first martyr and the Christians were scared to death so they dispersed into three basic areas Antioch Philistia I think and uh, Syria they, they dispersed that's called the diaspora the, the children of God dispersed they got out of Jerusalem and here's James these were people that were in his church. These were people that sat at his feet and listened. And all of a sudden, out of fear, Stephen was just stoned to death. We've got to leave. And they did. But their pastor never lost track of them. And he wrote this letter and he says, greetings. And then he says, count it all joy. Count it all when you fall into these kind of trials and testings. For 10 minutes this morning before communion, I recited to you hurting people, hurting people, anniversaries of deaths. 
an entire, an entire assisted living facility that these precious, precious folks in Greeley are wandering down the hallways like sheep without a shepherd because their executive director was found dead in his truck. I love those people. I, I see them twice a week. And you know what? On Saturday, every Saturday afternoon, they come with help from the memory care unit the staff walks them to the service where we have our service. And they sit there. Some of them don't know where they are, but they sure do know the songs we sing. People come in wheelchairs. They come with their canes. They come with their walkers. Some furniture walk or hallway walk. They use the wall to guide them. 15, 20, 25 people every Saturday. And we sing the old hymns and there's on a Saturday that goes by that I don't see some tears. Why? They love the, they love the Lord and they love the word and they have no excuses. They're going to be there. I love them. Now they're hurting. I pray that Broomfield Community Church will come alongside of them and lift them up in prayer. Love them. They love you because I brag about you all the time. They pray for us. They pray for you. Let's pray for them. My brethren, so when you have, whenever you do a book study, I, I'm trying not to make this a, a, co a Bible college seminary class. That can be so boring. Amen, you guys have went there. Or any college class. I don't want it to be boring. But if I were to give you the three major points that I would share with you to better understand this book, they'd all start with A. Authorship, who was... James, the half-brother of Jesus. Then I would share with you who the audience was. Who was the letter written to? And why was it written? Well, I shared with you, it was to mainly Christian Jews who were under persecution, both from the Sanhedrin, the 72 Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, and the Pharisees, and the Romans. They were coming after them to my brothers who are scattered abroad, the diaspora. You really need to remember that word. It's a funny word. It simply means dispersed. It means to leave. So here we have this precious pastor sitting down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he says to my brethren, consider it all joy. When you're tempted, when you're tested, knowing this, there are three evidences of your testing. The number one evidence is maturity. Did you know that? Is that maturity? Maturity, yes, maturity. G growing up. Oh, maturing. Maturing, yes. You Puerto Rican say it weird. <laughs> To mature, to be perfect. And actually, the three things, the three evidences of learning and growing in your trials is this. And, and, and James listed for us that you have, may be perfect and, uh, and entire. In other words, you're not needing anything and wanting nothing. And as I was doing my studies on this, just that one verse, James is referring to the old Greek Olympic Games. And the winner of the pentathlon, five events, he was known to have these three things in his life. He was mature, 
He was physically fit and he was in need of nothing. Now, I want to ask the church of Broomfield Community Church, are we mature or at least maturing in Jesus Christ based on his word? Not chronologically, because only God can, it can stop that or whatever. But are we growing in Jesus because of our trials? There's a story told of a pastor that went to see a precious, precious lady in his church. And she had just suffered a stroke. I believe it was Warren Wearsby who went to see a lady in his church. And as she was in the hospital recovering from her stroke, she was given word that her husband just had a horrible heart attack, brought to the hospital and passed away while she was trying to recover from a stroke. And Warren Wearsby walked into her room and she said, why are you here, Pastor? An 85-year-old saint of God and Pastor Wearsby says, well, I'm here to encourage you, and I'm here to pray for you. And she said, well, how are you going to pray for me? What are you going to pray for? Well, for healing. And, he, and she stopped him. She stopped him. She said, Pastor, I'm glad you're going to pray for my healing, but there's only one request on my heart that God would help me grow through this. Mm -hmm. That I wouldn't reject him or allow bitterness to get in my heart, that, but that I would grow, that I would become more mature, that I would be found entire, wanting nothing, needing nothing. Let me learn through this. Let me count it all joy. I can't believe we got all, all the way down to verse 3. There's a lot of meat there. Mm -hmm. And I left two pages out. But I'm going to bring this service to a close. But as I do, I want you to compare two audiences. I want you to compare the audience at Corinth to the audience that James was writing to. Corinth was rich, they were greedy, they were arrogant, they were proud, they stepped on the little person and exalted themselves, even taking all the food and even getting drunk at a communion service. Paul says, should I praise you for that? And he says, for goodness sake, no. Then compare the, dis, the diaspora, those Christians who are running away from beatings and stonings and martyrdom to be able to raise their family in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. What a, what a dichotomy. Two completely different churches. And by the way, there's only one thing they had in common. Paul and James were both martyred. James, just to close this out, I wonder how we would handle this. James was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple. But the fall didn't kill him. I didn't know that. I was always taught that the fall killed him. It did not. And there are a number of historians, especially Josephus, who said, but James survived the fall, so they clubbed him and beat him to death until he died. Do you think James was mature and entire, complete in the Lord Jesus to be able to do that? We have a long way to go, don't we? I know I do. And I have not even gotten to the key verse yet. Wisdom. Next week.